Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guess what? It's time to talk about tactics in Terran versus Terran. We spent some time in the core strategy videos and core strategy examples and in the openings video exploring how things go from the beginning to the middle to the end about uh, how to set yourself up stably initially, how to uh, move out onto the middle of the map to secure expansions, how some of those late game transitions work. And what I wanna look at right now uh, pretty much for this entire video is just l littler tactical tricks and tidbits that will arise throughout your games that will be hopefully very valuable. But the fact of the matter is, this is high value. Oh man. First thing, let's start with the barracks, baby. Let's start with the barracks. The barracks scout is one of the most important things to do in this matchup. After you build your first um, marine, or two marines, generally no more than one or two, often zero, just float into the base. I'd like you to note that, yeah, there's an academy getting built here, yeah, there's an expansion being built here, but if we look, where did Sharp actually choose to scout first? He chooses to scout where the production is, because the production is often the biggest indicator as to what the hell's going on. Sharp is n not here to... Um, so is there an armory? Is there an academy? This is this is the indication. It's how many add-ons are on factories. For instance, if Sharp got here and saw two factories, both with add-on, Sharp would conclude, oh, probably a lot of tanks. Definitely not mass vulture, because he doesn't have enough factories for that. Here, three factories, two without add-on. Those are pro almost certainly building vultures. In fact, I can just chill here for a moment and then just look and see what the hell's up. Um, it's great. It's it, it, essential. It's one of the most important aspects to getting to mid-game stably. And there's some um, other important things to note with barracks scouting. When you're sending that barracks out, be sure to be sending it to valuable locations. One example that you just saw me highlight was the production is particularly important. But here we see light moving down along the attack path. Light, if you look on the minimap, is doing this build that I spent a lot of time talking about in the Terran vs. Terran openings video. He's going for one factory expand and then just producing vultures right out the gate. No add-on, no nothing. And so this, this barracks is actually moving along where the attack path would be. And you can actually see it's angled diagonally, right? This is not... Uh, a man right clicking into a main base and me reading into it. It's literally moving along this vector. It's not trying to cut down and left into the main base. And this permits light to do really useful things like see a damn attack coming. There it is. He, so he sees those marines, but you see those vultures that were just flickering in and out of vision? These are the kinds of things that can help highlight, oh my gosh, I think that they I need to play a little bit defensively here. Or at least I need to be careful. Light never plays defensively, though. Light's always looking to attack. You know what's also awesome? Oh my gosh, my opponent. It looks like my opponent is not expanded. So you know what? My opponent never gets to expand. This is the most annoying thing. I mean, this is not going to end the game. You can build a command center nearby. But sometimes you can really mess with someone, man. Oh, it's so satisfying. It also gives you a very sharp read on whether or not your opponent's expanding because you're at his expansion. You know what I'm saying? All right. Other thing to note. You may have seen in uh, previous videos people building barracks in the middle of the map to enable that scout to get there just a little bit sooner. Be real careful because sometimes your opponent will do the same thing and you want to make sure that you're in a sufficiently hidden location. This game turned out really luckily, but I watched a game between two players where one found the others, rallied marines, and then just killed off the scouting worker, or excuse me, the constructing worker, and then everything just slowly ended from there. <laughs> uh, what is the next thing that I want to look at? Okay, so th these are some notes right at the start of the game. Interestingly enough, there's just not that many other things to consider in the mid-game. It's really not. Because Marines aren't doing anything. It's, it's all the barracks. Okay, let's take a look at the... This is called mine spreading. Yes. So, 
In other matchups, when you're planting mines, you'll often want clusters of them. In this matchup, it's generally important to have a spread. We want to keep vision in lots of different places, see where things are moving, and down the road, this is very wasteful of scans. Each of these, I want you to imagine these mines, each of these is like the tiniest little flag that maybe can turn into a bigger flag later. This tiny little set of mines right here, maybe we just see our opponent hasn't gone there. We know we can actually just walk tanks there and siege them up. Um, even these mines that were planted just moments ago, all right, there's the ones uh, at the start. Hold on, and even these mines, these could this could turn into a big flag. This could turn into a contain with tanks behind it. And we know as a Terran player, we can just walk up to those mines. They deal with a very severe problem that exists in Terran versus Terran, which is I don't want to walk out into the middle of the map into the darkness, because if you have tanks pre-sieged, you just blow up all my stuff and now I'm behind. So important tactic, look at a mine at the expansion, mines leading up to the expansion. Spread your mines out, spread your mines out. Don't, don't put all your mines in one location, all your eggs in one basket, all your tires on one axle. That's the way it should be. Um, Another thing to talk about, let's see here. I have a lot of videos to look through. Here, let's do this one next. Uh, we took a little bit of a look at this um, last time, but didn't talk uh, about it in too much detail. This is a fight in the mid game that happens all the time, where both players want to siege up as far to the enemy's side of the map as possible. Um, and if two players are doing it, they're going to meet in the middle. In this uh, clip, we see there's five tanks for orange, and uh, I think there's three goliaths. There might be a fourth one in there, but there's three vultures. Last has three tanks and a lot of vultures. I'm not going to count them. In short, this is a slightly stronger, sturdier army that might just get overrun in terms of numbers. You see that it's 92 to 73 supply. One of the things that I will recommend that we'll see in this video is a few things starting with you don't have to unsiege all your forces all the time holy shit that i say that wrong you don't have to siege all your forces all the time let's take a look at what sharp does sharp the orange player oh by the way the barracks strikes again look at those barracks providing all that glorious vision <laughs> yeah barracks are the best unit in the game so in this, the, the southern tank for Sharp and this top left, this northwestern tank, are going to siege. And then Sharp is just going to carefully leave everything else unseaged just to shoot and to kite. I really recommend playing with this in these small mid-game battles. Siege mode is better the larger the numbers are. But in these small numbers, look at this, just taking an opportunity to kite backwards exploit um, the space that he has, inviting the vultures to come forward into what is basically a concave. And at this moment, Sharp came out way ahead in this fight. Part of that was just him pulling all these units back into a concave. Second thing I really wanna highlight that's going to come up in this clip, this really common mid game tactic, three tank shots destroy one tank. Make sure you're target firing your tanks. We're about to see red not target fire. We will see orange do target fire. <laughs> For some reason, I felt like there needed to be a word there. Not target fire, do target fire. Okay, watch. See his red tanks? They're gonna shoot this Goliath. See, look, there they are. I mean, he shoots the vulture. Blam, death to the vulture. And now, look at these tanks immediately shoot Last's tanks. There's some other just auto attack nonsense happening in the midst of this. But this was a, as far as I'm concerned, a gigantic win for Sharp.
Um, I think I was showing that the, these tanks aren't shooting because they don't quite have vision. But again, that's what the benefit of the barracks is. Look at this. This is very nice. All those vultures are dead. Almost all the tanks are dead. Big win for Sharp. Um, another thing I want to unseach early aggression. Yeah. Often, um, y y you've seen me show these videos where players are moving out onto the map with like eight vultures and three tanks or moving out onto the map with, uh, hell, this. A couple tanks, a couple goliaths. If you catch your opponent being a little light on the defense, you can just march in and do a lot of, uh, a lot of damage. Blue does not have siege mode yet. Siege mode is good in larger numbers, but is not really necessary in smaller numbers. So here, very flexible force. Goliaths and tanks are one of the few units in Brood War that you can attack move. Like shoot, move a little bit, shoot, move a little bit, shoot, move a little bit. Look at this, this is just a very effective killing off of a lot of stuff. Light won the, won this game so badly. Now, what, what what are the really important things that happen there, right? Um, one, the critical lesson of, dude, you just don't have to be sieged all the time. We saw in this fight, purely unsieged, we saw in the previous one, Piano, excuse me, uh, in the previous one, um, um, uh, Sharp used two siege tanks that were sieged and all the rest weren't. Great. But the big game here is... A little the kill on the tanks, and mainly the control of the outside of this ramp. This is something that can happen a lot in the mid game, man. This I think is th this is the biggest feeling like oh god I hate this matchup I really screwed something up is when you just get contained like this. This is why people build so many vultures at the start of the game and plant mines everywhere and just move out. Yeah, maybe I can't kill you with those vultures maybe these vultures won't be useful for the full game but this is really hard to break out of and i took another clip of this um coming up yeah th this is what this is not it there it is um, so this is that same game, sped up into the future a little bit. Look at the way that Light executes this contain. This, again, I want you to sense this is the big danger that you're trying to avoid, but um, just the tactical strength of this. This is a monster position to be in. And there's a couple of pieces to this contain that are important to note. First of all, there is a smattering of anti-air, both in the form of detection, but Goliaths to just shoot down drop ships, shoot down wraiths. Tanks are in a line. Tanks are not clumped up. Often in TVP, you'll kind of have a few tanks in the front, some in the middle, some in the back, kind of spread out. Lines. You want lines in this matchup. Uh oh. Messed up my chair settings. And hey, look at this. A small little tiny force here with a missile turret being constructed. There's also the barracks that's in between. Look at this. It's it's a full ring of vision. There's even a vulture mine at the bottom center area. Also, this clip doesn't have audio. I accidentally didn't unmute it. And so in this position, there's a few unseaged tanks for light. Uh, Piano, who's the Terran player, under the name Organ, open bracket, open bracket, open bracket, open bracket. He tries to break out. Doesn't manage to do so successfully. So Light inches his contain back just to, just to small as little amount and just chills here. Remember what the next phase of this matchup is? Phase two is extend out onto the map and take a third. Very difficult to do that. There's Goliaths patrolling. There's the barracks, which is the best unit in the game, floating at the front. Yeah, mines here. Ignore the red on the mini-map. They ain't doing nothing, man. I would strongly recommend that if you're a player in Terran vs. Terran, you not try to go for this too often. For the longest time, um, in all matchups, players were obsessed with contains. Like, if I can just get two base contain against two base and just win with a contain, oh, it'd be glorious. Okay. 
God. I wish I had audio here, man. There's no volume on this clip. Look, this is so hard to break. And it looks maybe a little bit like, oh my gosh, is Piano actually going to do it? Is he going to? No, no, actually no, not in a million years. Nope, Vultures march up. Clear that all off. Kaboom, kablooey, kadooey. GG. Really important mid-game tactic. Um, let's see here. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, let's see, one more thing. Oh, this is the follow-up to that. It's totally okay, just in, in deference to how frightening of a game that was. You never want to be in the position where you get contained on any map. Choke points will vary from map to map, but on Fighting Spirit, it's this fat bridge. And look at this. Mong moves out with three tanks. That's it. Just moves out with enough to just be like, dude, you can't you can't contain me there. I mean, yeah, Light could put some stuff there, and yeah, Light could put some stuff there, but good, Mong is not gonna get contained, blocked in there. Not a chance. Just just do this early. Do this early. So, um, another thing that I want to talk, spend a little bit of time talking about, is Wraiths in the matchup. Because we've seen some of the uh, Vulture stuff, we've talked a little bit about that. Wraiths are a really interesting unit in the matchup, because often there's just not anti-air early, because most people are trying to build Vultures and tanks. First of all, using Vultures to help support, uh, excuse me, Wraiths to support your Vultures, really smart, really good to do. Due to sensational SCV control from uh, Blue, we see that this Wraith was, or excuse me, uh, that Red lost all his Vultures. But what makes Wraiths annoying is the fact that they can just slowly chip away SCVs one at a time. And you're never going to kill a player with Wraiths early game. Pretty much never going to do it, but... Two Wraiths means four shots to kill an SCV. And so just chilling here, picking them off a little time. Got to keep a very hawkish eye on that because very easy to just accidentally lose one to a Goliath. Goliaths kill Wraiths stupid fast. Great, there comes the Wraith. Look at how long these Wraiths stay. Goliaths don't get range early, and you should not get range early if you're a Terran player. Against a Terran player early on. You just keep flying around, keep trying to pick off stuff. Um, one of the great benefits of Wraiths is that they can kill off these scouting barracks. And now all of a sudden, I have Wraith tank versus your tank's plus no vision, so my tanks will always be able to see farther than your tanks. After that initial harassment is done, when those Goliaths show up, pull it back and kill off the barracks. It's huge. A lot of players will uh, just get cloak if they're building any wraiths at all early game and just do stuff like this. Notice that these wraiths picked off the SCV that was building the refinery. Focus on being disruptive by picking off SCVs that are mid-construction. Those tend to be the most vulnerable. Where do these wraiths fly to? Often up to this area where there's a third or where fourths and fifths are built to just continue to be annoying. Um, but but also very often pull all the way back to the front um, to help get the tank's additional vision. Here is uh, one video that I just wanted to briefly show. Look at this. Last is in a situation where he's built some vultures and two tanks. And his opponent has a lot of vultures here, planting a lot of mines, a lot of vultures here, more vultures being produced. And so look at this little positioning thing. This is a very important tactic in this matchup, just making a structure at the front so that way it's harder for vultures to run by. Because if you get surrounded by vultures, they plant mines all around you. You can't escape, you just die. Uh, so if you can block them, the vultures have to just come from one side and tanks will excel in that situation. One of the things that I have not really talked that much about is drops. How do you use drops in this early period of the game? 
One of uh, the really nice things that you can do is Goliath drops. For instance, if I have some tanks that are sieged up here and my opponent comes in with Goliaths, I'll note, just circumstantially, a lot of things have to be true that aren't often true. If I'm the red Terran player, I have to have already built Goliaths, already have a dropship, and it needs to be sufficiently early in the game that my opponent pretty much only has tanks. This happens sometimes. I would not call it very often, but sometimes you'll wind up in this situation. Sometimes you'll wind up in a weird spot. Um, and Goliath drops are very good if your opponent only has tanks because Goliaths, they're not the best against SCVs. But when the tanks show up, the Goliaths just load up and go away. What if I had a Wraith? What if I had a Wraith? Oh, the Goliaths drop and just blow up the Wraith immediately. So, you know, you can do really annoying stuff with Goliath drops. Do really annoying things like pick off individual siege tanks. You can get a lot of value out of Goliath drops. There's also, uh, where is... You can do things like, more commonly, if you did something like Vulture Wraithy at the start of the game, you already have a starport, you've already built Vultures, so you just get a quick add-on and you uh, put some Vultures inside that drop. So here we see a lot of the red units in defensive positions. Watch this really nice play. Vulture drops, moving on in. And this dealt some damage. Do not ever think that the important thing in this matchup is to kill workers. Do not. It's to take whole bases and to kill whole bases. This move allowed Mong to move really aggressively out onto the map. That's the importance of this move. Look at all these units that are way in the wrong position. And Mong is about to try to attack well, one siege tank. Oh, three siege tanks. Okay. Drops are really great. I, I would recommend against trying to do too much cute stuff with drops. This is a game where Piano just does... I don't even understand what he's trying to do. He, he does like a tank vulture drop. Tries to like plant mines here. He's getting some shots off with this tank. It's, it, I mean, you just, you just literally back up from the mines. And I mean, yeah, no, he, he killed a tank, and that's good. But now comes the silliest thing. Okay, he's gonna drop it. Here he goes, and he sieges it up! It fires once. Bam! Will it fire again? No. No, that was it. <laughs> Drops are not good in these small little amounts in that early phase of the game. Let's see. I did mine spreading, unseized early aggression, wraith, positioning to block, secure. Ah! Forgot to talk about this, uh, but mentioned it briefly in the wraith section. Um, in, in the wraith section, you heard me talk about getting additional vision for tanks. Here, we see a tank vulture versus tank vulture fight. This should generally stale out unless both players actually really want to commit to it. Um, you know, one player literally just retreats and then that's, that's that. But if you can get some wraiths in there, you can wind up into a position where you just start slowly overwhelming. Here's the wraiths coming in. Three wraiths, two shot, an enemy wraith, that dies. And now all of a sudden, there's the slow chipping that winds up happening, but way more importantly, the vision. I can always pressure with siege tanks because you just can't see my siege tanks, unless you spend time scanning. In this spot, green does have mines. So green can wind up seeing sufficiently far. But if you're blue, you scan kill off the mines and use your wraith to continue to advance forwards. So that's a lot of the sort of starting of the game stuff that I wanted to begin talking about. Um, where is the posturing for positioning? This is great. 
So a lot of the mid-game stuff is about trying to get your tanks into good position, right? If I actually come over to this phase, I'm kind of talking about phase three, right? Mass expanding in battles for position. What, what does this even mean? How does this tactically look? Well, this is right after that vulture drop that we saw permit Mong to begin to make some moves. And this is pretty cool. He cuts real deep in here. Plants mines up on that base. Sieges some tanks up here. And skedaddles. Okay. Look at this. Look at this mini-map situation. If you watch the core strategy video, you know I talk a lot about half-map splits. The idea is, in Terran vs. Terran, it's very hard to prevent mass expanding. Pretty much happens every single game. Red is, has his three bases and wants to easily take these two bases. Similarly, Purple is going to easily take these two bases that are up in the top right of the map. But this base that's up here just off screen, this one at 3 o'clock and this one at 9 o'clock, these are the two that are up for contention. So Mong advances forward. He moves all the way forward. Now, we're 10 minutes into the game. He's not going to expand to this right base anytime soon. But he's securing it. Look at this. This puts a lot of pressure on light. It's going to be very hard for light to break some siege tanks, especially if there winds up being five, six tanks that arrive up there. And because Mong didn't uh, siege up everything, he still has the ability to make some plays. Notice again, what did Light do when he saw a big force moving in from this side? Look at the minimap. He sent those vultures out immediately. These vultures are trying to do the same thing. These tanks are trying to secure this expansion. Light says, no, I, I want to get my own side expansion. So he moves these vultures really far up and plants mines there just kind of planting a little flag you know maybe i'll plant my mine or my tanks here soon and then i'll take that left base so mung does this really interesting play where he actually slices right down here and this this is painful <laughs> okay look at that look at that line he literally went cut through middle, plants the line, let's look at Light's positioning. Top's cut off, okay, there's a base right over there, and now Mong's getting ready to take base four and five up in the top right. These vultures were a little out of position, so now Mong gets to siege up here. Where does, where does Red expand to? Where does Light expand to? Huh. Oh, damn, how much longer is this video? Oh, it's almost done. A few of these push right up against each other, uh, but this moment in time is a good illustration of how to move forward, move around, look for spots, and then just <laughs> siege right the hell up. Very hard for your opponent to break through it. This is why vultures are very useful. This is, the concept here is breaking greedy positions. Often, you'll go, wait a minute, you're trying to double expand and contain two very far away fronts at the same time? You gotta be weak somewhere. Mong actually has a lot of units, but even this far right side is starting to go, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how safe this is over here. So while these units were a completely vulnerable position that could have been broken. It's this left one that Light chooses to just waltz up to. And he literally sends in the vultures first, lets them absorb the shots, and just blows up the shit out of these tanks. This is the skill in this matchup. You're just trying to identify if you are secure enough in a position. You're trying to identify if you are... Um, if your opponent's being greedy, how greedy your opponent's being. Okay, I'll just break through it. Here, after winning this, both players kind of have a repositioning war. Remember those mines that Light placed early? Oh, maybe he's going to try to use them. He's going to do it carefully, though. He's going to move to the left, and then look again. 
He cuts as far left as he feels like he can handle cutting to secure that left turn expansion. Yeah, look at that. Excellent. Oops, didn't mean to pause it. And he's expanding. And he's expanding. So good. All right. So, let's see here. Where is, this is hooray good positioning. Oh uh, yeah, this is this is a good one. So um, as you're doing these these posturing things, the the simple way to identify whether or not you have successfully postured is just to ask how many expansions are behind me. How many expansions do I roughly control? Sometimes you'll wind up in a position where I control six, you control. four, five and one of them neither person controls good six on five i'm winning yeah here look i can just do a cursory glance here look at this we got light has this expansion he has a pretty solid line here he even has a scouting science facility to see what's up he has tanks over here on the right he's taking this command center uh, on the right he has these bottom bases populated with many a worker so right now light basically has seven bases and Mong only has five. All right, well, what is a player to do? Um, one of the things that you'll see commonly pop up in these late game situations is dropship usage in large numbers. Dropships you need to not think about these as just killing of bases, but more about seizing positions that will destabilize your opponent's position. So Mong, who does this drop, does a few things clever. One, he just identified a weak position and attacked it. But two, he's going to begin reinforcing this position because it's hard to engage on. Here's Light using a lot of money to try to kill off a little bit, but... More units just get dropped, blow up light stuff. And now Mong has control of this expansion. It's great. It's fantastic. And now that Mong kind of feels like he has control of this base, at least reasonably enough, that's, that's hard up high ground with Goliaths protecting it. Mong is going to look to try to find other locations to destabilize. This right one looks pretty weak, but oh no! This is why players love scans and dropships in the late game. Scans and dropships. And here we see same logic from Light against Mong. Just trying to find any old weird position to be able to secure. Now this is, this is a, a very funky position for Light. Like, these units down here do not, technically do not defend any expansions or anything like that. But if Light were able to secure that, it would be hard to shut down that expansion location. Let me rephrase that. I completely said the opposite. I don't know why it's opposite day or some shit. If Light was able to secure this, Mong would not be able to get this base. And this is why I have a video of... Da -da -da -da. This is a really weird looking spot for a bunch of tanks to be sieged up. Flash was famous for this. He would have tanks sieged up in spots like this for like the whole game just to shut down one expansion. And from, you know, typical intuition, you'd go, well, I mean, the, the tanks have sort of achieved their goal here. But am I over committing? Maybe I should pull these tanks somewhere else and do something more beneficial. Maybe I should take these tanks and push forward. Maybe I should pull these tanks back and defend something. I mean, I can't just focus on one expansion, right? No, this is this is fantastic. This is so good. It is, it is so excellent. All right, so uh, why am I showing this here? Oh yeah, just showing how many bases Light has. So Light can basically stay super defensive. There's a drop here that I think gets cleaned up in a second. But uh, yeah, this was just a freeze frame. Okay. So, what are you to do if you're purple here? Another, another little tactic here. 
So there's just a whole lot of red spread everywhere. There's some tanks here, there's some tanks here. There's all these tanks that are up here denying this expansion. And for all the spreading that's been going on throughout the game, joining your whole army together and just finding one weak spot, even if it looks weird, can often be enough to just almost end the game. In this spot, Mong finds this way to slice through the middle of the map to this main base. Now, if I want to take away from the awesomeness of this move and just have you focus on the simple lesson, it's that... Yes, killing bases and taking bases is the most important thing in this matchup. But doing anything positive because you found a big weakness in their position is great. It is a weakness in Light's position. And Mong hits a pretty vulnerable spot, which is the main base production. This is, this is a pretty juicy target. There were battlecruisers that are getting produced. Two of them just chucked their lives away. And now we just see, ooh, man, if I'm, if I'm light, yeah, I actually have a ton of money. I mean, look at the bank. He has like 6k, 4k, but he's about to lose his entire main base. This was a very nicely executed move. So um, some last few tactical lessons um, that I want to talk about. This is, this is all from the same game. This game was like so perfect in terms of uh, lesson providing. In the super late game situation, Light gets a whole bunch of battle cruisers, And I want you to appreciate how Light has some real problems that start coming up. But he does the super important thing that you must always do with your battle cruisers. He keeps them together with his whole army. Tanks with the battle cruisers to fight against Goliaths. Oh, it looks like Mass Wraith from Mom. You know what Light does? He just keeps his whole damn army together. Battle cruisers are awesome. I love battle cruisers, especially late game in this matchup, as they just give you infinite value. But while the main base from light starts to be under big threat, the battle cruisers don't leave. They don't go anywhere. It's just this one giant blob army. This is sort of the ultimate end game blob army. And to protect your battle cruisers against Goliaths, that's why you leave them with the tanks. What do you do against mass wraith? This is super cool. So here's the final fight of this game. This has been a real slugfest, 40 minutes into the game, whole map's basically mined out. Here, if I just rewind it a bit. Here we have Battlecruiser tank, there's some Goliaths here, but in particular, there's a few Valkyries. And even more in particular, there are science vessels. So, what Light does is Light sees this coming in and he defensive matrix his, his own Valkyries. Because Valkyries, even in the small numbers of six that are there, just annihilate Wraiths. Goliaths are good too, but Valkyrie with D matrix plus Battlecruiser, the ultimate endgame army. So, Throughout the course of this episode, we've just done a pretty big smattering of tactics starting at the outset of the game, going all the way to the ending, that hopefully provides some ideas of how to overcome some of the problems that exist in TVT or even just how to get an extra edge here and there. Oh, that was a good stretch. Next week is a big week because it's micro week. Ooh, we're going to look at a lot of different micro situations. We're going to be looking at basic micro, like melee and ranged units and how to generally control them. We're also gonna look at real specific stuff, like how exactly should you control mutas? How exactly should you control lurkers? How exactly should you control shuttle reaver? So micro weeks next week, we're gonna be doing a whole bunch of that. And then following that, we're gonna do ZVZ week and PVP week, boom. Um, hope you guys had a great day. I'm done, I'm gonna go eat dinner and then I'm going to go watch some jazz. Oh, Dana, I need to watch his jazz. Oh!